So I'm going to talk about proof of work a little bit. Um, so I wrote a lot about proof of work and one of the threads I wrote on Twitter, like, you know, all my, even my books start as shit posts on Twitter. That's just a <laughs> true fact <laughs> was a failure to understand proof of work is a failure to understand Bitcoin. And that really, um, like a lot of people wrote me after I wrote this thread that it really changed the way of looking at proof of work and looking at Bitcoin and, um, that's still one of the, my favorite topics to talk about in Bitcoin, um, like how important proof of work is and, uh, as, uh, yeah, as we discussed before, how it builds up its own arrow of time. So I'll try, I'll try to be a, as brief as I can. And if, if something doesn't make sense or looks weird or whatever, just scream because I don't see any one of you <laughs> thanks to full screen presentation. So I, I only have uh, audio cues. All right, let's go. So we're going to talk about Bitcoin. So. If you really want to annoy someone is to ask them what is Bitcoin, <laughs> because there's a million different answers. And just for the purpose of, of this presentation, kind of, I'm going to tell you that Bitcoin is money plus time, plus energy, plus information. And what this actually, this combination actually creates is apolitical money. And if you remove any of those four from the equation, you, you basically have a shit coin. You have something that doesn't really work. So you need all four of those. And I'm going to talk about all, all four of those. But why, why is this important in the first place? And we know kind of like the gold bucks know this, the Austrian economists know this, that the money is broken. And Hayek phrased it beautifully in like a long time ago, 1978, that gov government monopoly on the issuance and control of money is the root of all monetary evil. And I think... We see this very clearly now, you know, people getting deplatformed, whole countries getting <laughs> deplatformed, bank accounts frozen left and right, trillions created out of thin air, um, you know, to fight emergencies and those kind of things to fight wars. And so if you, the problem is basically this, if someone has the power to create and control the money, this pow power will be abused always. This, like we have tried fiat money before, and this was always the case. It always ended in disaster because someone, someone got in charge that abused this power massively and then all hell breaks loose, literally. And so, again, Bitcoin is money plus time plus energy plus information. And um, I'm going to talk about money first. So what is money in the first place? <laughs> you know, Robert Freelove launched the whole sh show just for, for this question alone. I'll try to do it in like two slides. <laughs> so money is information, basically. Money records who owes what to whom. And we historically, and just in general, there are only two ways to do money. You can record it in a list, like who, who owes what to whom, you can record it in a list, or you can use physical tokens, physical items that you pass around. And depending on how many of these items you have, you, you basically, quote unquote, society owes you one, so, so to speak. And so we use shells, bones, like all Bitcoiners kind of know this, uh, and salt and all the rest of it. And um, historically, the, the best money we used was gold and silver coins. Um, the reason is because gold is, very hard to make more of. And with lists, we have lists also for 5,000 years. So that's informational money. The problem is that lists get corrupted very easily. So why use money in the first place? The, the reason why we use money is because otherwise we would have to keep track in our heads who owes what to whom. And so we run into this limit of the Dunbar number. So every tribe who has not discovered money, who does not use money for themselves, you can't outgrow a size of 150 people because it's just the combinatorial explosion gets too big. The, the relationships get too many and you can't keep it in your head and then um, society does not function smoothly anymore. So you, you only have those two, things, do, do those two things and they are very, very different. So lists and physical coins, physical tokens are very, very different. And the reason why they are different is because the one thing is information and the other thing is an object, a physical thing. And they behave very different. And I, I always love this quote by George Bernard Shaw where he says, if you, have an, if you have an apple and I have an apple and we exchange these apples, then both of us um, will still have one apple. But if you have an idea and I have an idea and we exchange these ideas, then both of us will have each two ideas. So information can be like the only way to share information is to copy it. You cannot share information in any other way. That there is just no way. Otherwise, the only way to share information without copying it is to pass the physical medium where it is written down onto someone else. But still, you know, the, the speaker still retains the information. That's the problem. Like that's the, that's the double spent problem, you know, like, <laughs> and so even, that's even true. Like you, let's say you have some information that's only recorded on one physical, on one paper. 
but if you still read it, you have it in your head, you know, like you, it's, it's, it's a really tricky problem, the double spend problem. And Bitcoin actually solved the double spend problem. It solves it uh, with using proof of work. And so these lists always have the double spend problem. This was true in the past as well, you know, like that's why we invented uh, double bookkeeping, those kind of things. Like it's, it's very, <laughs> it's very rewarding if you have a little bit of, um, you know, evil energy in you to just uh, <laughs> extend the list a little bit or, um, you know, add a couple of sheep, a, a couple, a, a bushel of wheat here for you and your family. Like this always happened in the past. So lists can be cheated very, very easily. And um, another problem with those kind of lists, those those informational representations, is that they might they might represent physical reality, but they don't have to. You can lie on a list. You know, like how many bushels of wheat are in the warehouse? Like it 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 doesn't like you, you always have to keep the list in sync so to speak and that's a big problem that's not true for physical coins like the, the physical coins in space time take they, they track themselves they take care of themselves and so another important thing about the physical coins is that they are permissionless you don't have to ask anyone to spend your coin and that they are unforgeable costly like i mentioned before gold why the reason why we use gold is that it's very hard to make more of so it's <laughs> scarcity is terribly important for money because if, if something is not scarce, that's why we say money doesn't grow on trees. Like if money would grow on trees, then it's, it's not good money. Also, if money perishes, it's not good money. And so the thing that blew my mind and what's, what I'm going to talk about next, and I already mentioned it, is that physical tokens, they keep track of themselves. Like who owes what to whom? If you think of this as like inf information that needs integrity to, through time and space, if you use gold coins, you don't need a central authority to keep track of things. The, the, the coins will do, will do the work. But if you put it on a list, then suddenly you require time. You require time and it, it immediately also centralizes. Like um, before Bitcoin, every list was, you, you had a central list keeper. And also, I, I, I will tell you, if you remove proof of work, this will be true again. <laughs> Always. That's just unavoidable. <laughs> and the thing that, that I'm going to harp on next is, is going to be the time part. Because the, the physical tokens, they are timeless. And once you put something on a list, time comes into play. Why is that? It is because A has to, become, has to come before B, has to come before C, because you're not allowed to spend money that you don't have. That just doesn't make sense. So you, every list needs an absolute order. You can't do a list of transactions if you can't order them absolutely. If the order isn't clear, you will always run into conflicts. Someone will, you, you will create money out of thin air just by, just by messing up the order. You will try to spend money that you don't already have, those kind of things. All right, so money, time, energy, and information. Why is time so important? I already hinted at it, but just to drive the point home, these are all the references in the Bitcoin white paper written by Satoshi. It has eight references, three of them, almost half of them are about time stamping, are about time keeping. <laughs> like that should, that should tell you something. And he also has many quotes in, in the announcement and in the white, white paper where he says, you know, the, the, the distributed network acts as a, as a distributed time stamping server. And there is a great uh, piece that was written uh, before my piece, Bitcoin is Time, that says that Bitcoin is a decentralized clock. And that's, that's exactly right. And I'm going to tell you now like, why this is important and, and kind of how it works. It's, it's a bit difficult to understand, but I'll, I'll do my best in like five or 10 minutes. So again, if we have a list, we need an absolute order of things. So time comes into play. And that's exactly what Bitcoin does. Every time you hear the term blockchain, erase it from your memory and automatically translate it to time chain. Because what, what these blocks do in Bitcoin and in every other system that works like it, is the, it creates an arrow of time in cyberspace. So it is an informational construct that builds up an arrow of time. And it's very important how this informational construct is constructed because you can't use absolutely anything for an arrow of time. Like the natural numbers, for example, or a calendar is not a great arrow of time because you already know the future. Like if I'm telling you my error of time is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I can skip to 120 and jump into the future. I also know the past perfectly. And so you need something that has random processes embedded in it so that the future is always uncertain. And you have something that does not allow you to change the past, just like with our own regular physical error of time. It's, it's very hard to change the past. <laughs> like quantum physics aside, <laughs> those kind of things. The past is unchanging and the, the future is uncertain. And the same is true in Bitcoin. And it builds just, just by using information alone, it builds up this, this arrow of time in cyberspace. And so you can see this yourself if you go to mempool space, for example. You see 
um, <laughs> your tear of time is <laughs> reversed. <laughs> so it goes from right to left. But the green blocks here that are still in the mempool, from the eyes of the Bitcoin network, they don't have a time. They are still, they are still timeless. Like transactions only get a timestamp, so to speak, by the Bitcoin network, which is the block height, which you see here, the 746471. And that's also why you can use the, the block time. Like if, if a block was found, I timestamp all my articles with, with the block height because it tells you the time worldwide uh, for every time zone for everything. And it's like 10 minute time window. It's, it's, it's approximately right. And just, just to be clear, it is about the error of time. It's not that this is a precise clock. It is about creating an order of events that is indisput indisputable. Like everyone can verify it and you cannot cheat the test, period. And what we have, have also now is we have this uncertain future in the, in the mempool and we have the present. We have like the, the eternal now, so to speak, the, the chain tip of Bitcoin is what's, what's happening now. And because of proof of work, rewriting, rewriting the past is very expensive. And because of the accumulative properties of proof of work, it gets exponentially more expensive and becomes so unlikely that you can say that, uh, you know, settlement in Bitcoin is final a, a couple blocks down. It's never really final though. Everything is probabilities. Uh, so, you know, that's how Nakamoto consensus works. There, there are no checkpoints. And so again, Bitcoin creates proof of, Bitcoin uses proof of work to create this era of time in cyberspace. And another way to saying the same thing is that Bitcoin creates an unforgeable history. And that is so important. Like we never had anything like this in the past. Everything we had in the past was always a, a record of history. And what's also, what's also important is like, <laughs> if, you, if you remove proof of work, you remove this property. The, the, reason, the reason why you can't change the past in Bitcoin is because of proof of work. And so if you remove this property, we are, we are, we are again back to the old system of lists where you have a couple of list keepers and they will tell you, no, no, this is actually what happened and we sign off on, on it and just, just trust us, bro. Like this is actually what happened. And with proof of work, proof of work has this property where you just look at the proof of work yourself and all the truth, all the information you need is embedded in the information itself. And this is, this is a, a, a mind blowing property of, of proof of work. That's also why you can, you, you don't need to have a trusted communication channel to broadcast the proof of work. You can just, you can give it to your enemies and, and they can, they are not able to alter the information. They would have to redo the proof of work, which is also to work for the system. <laughs> so it's, it's ingenious, like because, because the truth, because history, because everything you need to know is contained in the information itself, you can relay it in an untrusted communication channel. That's why like you, you can use any communication channel. Once you found a valid block, just push it out there. No one will be able to, to alter this. All right, next point. Why, why, is, why is all of this <laughs> tied to energy? Like why, why am I always saying, you know, like you, you can't rewrite this because of proof of work. It's because of the energy expenditure. So energy is gonna, gonna be next. So Bitcoin creates this, again, like this time chain, this era of time, time in, in cyberspace, a purely informational construct. But it, it, does, it does so by like, with the first version that Satoshi released, this machine of Bitcoin was set into motion. And every 10 minutes, approximately a new block comes in. And Bitcoin, like you probably have heard this in the past that Bitcoin is the most reliable system we, we ever had, like the most reliable computer network and so on. And for the last, I think 11 years now or something like that, it had 100% uptime. Bitcoin was, was down very, very briefly in its very, very early days. But ever since TikTok next block, approximately every 10 minutes, a new block comes in. And so the, the whole point of Bitcoin is this, that this machine keeps on going and and that it keeps building up this era of time, which, um, yeah, which <laughs> again, just TikTok, next block keeps on working. Why, does, why do we need energy for all of this? So the way you can think about it is that the energy expenditure acts like a shield around the past. So what, what miners actually do, miners, miners do not produce Bitcoin, miners produce blocks. And if the blocks are valid, they get rewarded by the network. And so the energy expenditure is completely independent from how much Bitcoin is mined or how fast it's going to be mined. So the Bitcoin issuance is set in time. This is also something that a lot of people fail to understand. Um, if this were not true, we would have mined all the Bitcoin already. So, so the hardness of Bitcoin and the issuance of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's monetary policy is linked to time and not to energy or anything else. That's also why we can say that 
until the year 200, uh, 2140, approximately, new Bitcoins are going to be mined. They're going to be issued. And mining after that will go on. Like even if, even if miners will get zero additional rewar re reward, they will still be rewarded by transaction fees. And that's, you need a way to fairly distribute the tokens of the system. And that's also, again, like the only way to do this in a trustless fashion without uh, central authority is with proof of work. Once you remove proof of work, you, you immediately default back to a trusted issuance by, by a central authority. And the way you can think about it, maybe to use the gold analogy is like, we are by mining gold, we are not creating new gold. We're digging it out of the ground. And with Bitcoin, it works the same way. We are not creating new Bitcoin. We are digging it out of the mathematical ground, so to speak. So all gold on earth already exists, like just ignoring, you know, asteroids that come down, those kind of things. But all gold already exists and we're digging it up. And with Bitcoin, it's the same thing. All Bitcoin already exists. And Satoshi, again, that's why he said the design of the system is set in stone with the first version. He knew that for the next, you know, so many years with the halving schedule and all the rest of it, Bitcoin is going to get issued, uh, is gonna, gonna get issued. And everyone who is willing to support the network and secure the network and help build up this arrow of time in cyberspace is gonna be rewarded with freshly issued, newly issued Bitcoin. But they're not creating it with energy. Otherwise, otherwise it would be very bad money because then someone would, you know, <laughs> build a couple of nuclear reactors or fusion reactors and they would effectively have a money printer. And so mining Bitcoin is not money printing. Mining Bitcoin, it, the only thing it changes is the distribution. Like who gets what percentage of the, of the pie? And uh, yeah, there, I, I, I'm convinced there is no other fair way to do issuance. And so now it gets a little bit technical. It's the only technical sli slide I have, I promise you. So these are real blocks, real um, hashes of block headers. And just, again, I, I, I said before, just by looking at a number, you can, you can make certain inferences about reality. And so that's what miners do. Miners try to find a random number that will fulfill certain conditions in this kind of game that is being, being played in Bitcoin. And so that's why randomness comes into play. Randomness comes into play through multiple factors, but miners basically try to find a random number. So they're rolling dice, that's all they do. And once you hit the dice correctly, everyone else who looks at this information can infer that Real energy was used because as far as we know, in our physical universe, there is no other way to flip bits. You have to, you have to use electrons to flip bits. There is, you cannot flip bits without doing work in our physical universe. So as long as computation requires energy, proof of work and Bitcoin will work. <laughs> and then you can infer also that someone, it is a costly signal. So someone, someone had some expenditure to produce this signal and that's why it's accepted. And that's why it can be accepted trustlessly. All right, so you just look at the block hash and the block header, and if the amount of zeros is large enough and everything else inside the block is valid, you, your node, will accept this transaction. And yeah, you can infer like how much cost approximately went into mining this block and so on. All right, why is all of this important? We're still on the energy side. With this energy use, you can, basically say that in Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the only thing, like <laughs> thanks to the difficulty adjusted proof of work, Bitcoin is the only thing in the universe where the map equals the territory. So I, I had another thread where I said, you know, like the map is not the territory and like the philosophers know this because you look at a picture of a pipe and it says, this is not a pipe. And like everyone knows this, um, it's <laughs> that the terrain that is presented in the map is not actually the terrain. And that's also coming back to, you know, the, the the money and the coin and the list and the gold coin and so on. The information that is represented in the list is never about, like it is about the reality, but it's never the reality it's a, itself. And in Bitcoin, this changes because the, the, the proof of work numbers in Bitcoin, they do not point to anything to the outside world. You know, Bitcoin is not, it's not, the, it's not recording anything from the outside world. It's a, it's a, it's a closed loop system, as Michael Saylor would say. Would say. And, and the conclusion is like the, why this is so beautiful and why this is so amazing. It's what, what Adam Gibson calls the reification of inf information. It's that we have information that when combined, when com like <laughs> we have information <laughs> at the public part and the private part. And you can use this information as if it was a physical coin. So the reification of information, I really like this term because with this energy use, you can build up 
an informational, a purely informational construct that behaves like a physical thing. And that is amazing. And that's also why, why Bitcoin, you know, can be used as peer-to-peer -peer money. That's also why you can, you, you, you can pour Bitcoin in your head, so to speak. You can put Bitcoin in your head. It's not a password to an account or anything like that. It's the value itself. You know, if you combine these 12 words, your, your private key with the public ledger that you can verify yourself from the ground up, from first principles, that is the value. It's, it's, it's very different than having a password in your head. It's like the value itself is in your head with these 12, 12 words. And, that, and that's just amazing. And that brings us to, to the last point, which is information. So again, we had Bitcoin is money plus time plus energy plus information. And why is the information part so important? <laughs> Again, I, I told you in the beginning, if you remove, if you remove one thing <laughs> from, from these four, then you revert back to a shitcoin, basically. And so information is important. It's all text all the time, as, as Beauty on said. And the information, it's, it's important that all of this is information because the only thing that you can teleport in this world is information. You can send it with the speed of light. And we, we, are, we live in an information society. We live in an electronic, very connected world. And so, Allow me to use a, 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 a metaphor in the last like two minutes or so. That Bitcoin is very much like a game of chess. And of course, you know, I, I know the Czech likes to play chess. That's why I put it in there. But I, I literally mean that and I have that in, in some of the pieces. It's, it's very much like you don't need, like to, to play chess, you don't need a, a physical instantiation of the board. And with Bitcoin as well, like if <laughs> everything that's happening in Bitcoin doesn't require a physical instantiation. So, that's a valid chess move and that's a valid chess game. And Bitcoin is just the same thing. Like everything, all that nodes do, all that miners do, you can understand it as like a, a, a game of chess that is played over a communications channel. It's like a publishing game. It's like a, Alan Franklin called it like a, a, a Wittgensteinian language game, which is also correct. So you, <laughs> you can look just at this information and if you're a chess player, you can make sense of it and you can actually, you know, in your head, watch the game being played and you can, you can tell, are these moves correct, are they not, and so on. Bitcoin does the same thing. So you get inf your node gets information. All it does is, were all the moves valid? If yes, update the state of the game on your node. And if everyone does that, consensus emerges naturally. There's no central authority that, that makes sure that everyone has the right information. Everyone does the work themselves and val validates everything from the ground up yourself. That's why full nodes are so important. That's why people say, you know, Bitcoin is an impenetrable fortress of validation. Everything is validated from the ground up and from first pr principles. And that's how it works. And the last thing I want to talk about um, in the information part, like why, why am I harping on about like information and Bitcoin being information and everything being information? It's because all informational systems have real physical limits. And what Bitcoin does, it's it, it is a system that builds up something where you can, even if your enemies agree on the state of the system globally, but global agreement has real physical limits without relying on the central authority, mind you, you know, like if, if you would rely on the central authority, it's, it's meaningless in the first place. Like the, then, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not an adversarial environment because then you're talking to, to friends by default, basically. So why, what, what are these physical limits and why is it important in, in the blockchain in the time chain world? I'm mentioning this specifically because some, some of the snake oil salesmen, they try to convince you that these physical limits do not exist and that, you know, uh, something better than Bitcoin can exist and those kind of things. So the earth is a very big place, but in terms of light speed, it is not. It takes about 50 milliseconds for light to travel from one place to the earth, from the, of the earth to the other. And Bitcoin has, with its 10 minute block time, it's just, you know, like big enough <laughs> that on earth, we can reach consensus. And just to visualize this in uh, like real terms, that's to scale the earth and the moon and how, light, how long it takes for light to travel. And so the reason why all of this is important is because there is nothing than, like there's nothing faster than light travel. So information can only travel at the speed of light. And to reach consensus, you will have to adhere to those physical limits and to the, to the physical laws of our universe. So if you would like to build a system like Bitcoin, oops, that works a little bit faster, that has a block time below 50 milliseconds, reaching consensus would be impossible. And we see this, you know, with some of the sh shitcoin forks that use faster block times uh, in, in, in the second area and so on. Like they have orphan blocks all the time, they fork all the time. So the, the, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that you only like, <laughs> you, 
it works well enough to reach global consensus in an adversarial environment. And that's all you need. And as you guys know, everything else can be built on top. So that's why we have the Lightning Network. And you know, as Pierre Oshar pointed out, there is nothing faster than the Lightning Network because you use Bitcoin settlement layer as like a direct peer-to-peer -peer tunnel transfer, so to speak. And um, yeah, that's that's how you should do it. So if you want to learn more about this le layered money <laughs> and those kind of books, and with that, I'm I'm done with the proof of work part. So I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs>